This is part 28 in the series that covers this sensational war diary written by a platoon leader named Kurt from the motorized SS Division Reich, which in 1942 would become the 2nd SS Panzer Division, Das Reich. The last time we were with Kurt, his division was racing towards the Smolensk-Moscow Highway on October 7th and 8th of 1941. In this episode, using Kurt's diary, a report from the SS Division Reich's Sturmgeschütz battery, and rare associated film footage, we'll follow the unit's assault up through their taking of the strategically important heights of Kolmina. Using original OKW situational maps, we'll get an overview of Operation Typhoon and gain insight into the German High Command's level of confidence at this point in the operation. This is a great series, so stick around. It's worth it. Here we are, looking at October 7th, 1941. The Wehrmacht's last great battle of encirclement at Vyazhma and Bryansk is at its height. During the drive north to reach the Smolensk-Moscow Highway, the division's battery of three Stugs supported the infantry's advance. At 900 hours during an attack on Slobodka, the enemy retreats. The battery commander, Captain Gunstas Stug, Prince Eugen, is in pursuit. A direct hit by a Soviet anti-tank gun leaves the Stug's periscope and targeting sites inoperable. After about an hour's work, the damage is repaired and the Stug is again on its way. The attack continues and as the formation begins along the approach to the highway, enemy infantry are suppressed by MPI fire from the Stug. At Nishnaya Petrayaika, Prince Eugen, now again at the tip of the formation, spots two well-camouflaged enemy anti-aircraft guns off to the right and destroys them with a pair of shots. Before being able to fire off an additional round, the Stug is struck and penetrated by a round just below its periscope, instantly killing three of the crew. The Stug's loader, Corporal Papriorki is only slightly wounded and manages to escape the burning hulk. He makes his way back to the battalion's field command and reports the death of his comrades. Before we move on to Das Reich's expected final push for Moscow, I'd like to thank M45's Patreon supporters. Without their support, the production of this series wouldn't have been possible. Patreon supporters get access to film footage that can't be shown here. Please take a look at our different levels of support and consider joining our community. As we zoom in to the situational map for October 9th, it's easy to recognize that something important is missing. Unlike all the other maps, there is no information about the enemy units. Is it a coincidence that this oversight happened at precisely this key moment in the campaign, with the surrounded enemy pockets, Moscow's supposed last defensive bulwark, about to be wiped out? The fundamental basis of political authority during the Third Reich was the Führerprinzip, or principle of the leader. At the top of the political hierarchy, it meant that the Führer's word was above all written law. In effect, it even meant that he was infallible, incapable of making mistakes or being wrong. On this day, October 9th, Otto Dietrich of the German Ministry of Propaganda, quoting Hitler himself, forecast in a press conference the imminent destruction of the armies defending Moscow. As Hitler had never had to lie about a specific and verifiable military fact, Dietrich convinced 
foreign correspondence that the collapse of all Soviet resistance was perhaps hours away. German civilian morale, low since the start of Barbarossa, significantly improved immediately. with rumors of soldiers even coming home by Christmas. Der 9. Oktober 1941. Im nächtlichen Vorstoß gelingt es uns ohne Feinberührung in a night action without being engaged by the enemy. We're able to advance up to the heights of Kolmina our uphill attack is set to launch at sunrise. In heavy street combat, we're forced to take each individual house. By noon, the area is in our hands. Although successful, the heavy enemy fire has inflicted considerable losses in our ranks. At the height of this chaotic attack, their ferocity actually forces us to leave our dead and wounded behind where they fall. Behind the town, the strong Soviet forces occupy well-prepared defensive positions, which include bunkers. During the fighting, the enemy sends assault groups forwards, which, with the support of armor, try to attack us on our exposed left flank in the valley. Half of my platoon occupy the last houses in the town, while the other half remains back in reserve. In response to the Russians' surprise attack, I receive the order to move those in reserve up as quickly as possible and provide relieving fire for those under attack. The enemy manages to maintain their intensity of fire on the town especially targeting the garden areas around the houses with their heavy mortar teams. To save time, I personally run back for my men. Within just a few minutes, we're returning and plan to mount a counterattack to quickly take the enemy's newly established firing positions. Having learned from the last few hours of urban combat, we advance in single file, with ten steps of separation between each soldier. A sudden nearby explosion throws me against the wall of a house, and my mind goes momentarily blank. I hear a shower of debris bounce off my helmet, and then the screams of wounded soldiers. Turning around, I see 11 of my men lying on the ground, wounded by the detonation of a mortar round. Other than myself, only the second in command, who was taking the last position of the procession, remains unwounded. With the help of a soldier who happened to be nearby, we carry the wounded into a house. We then grab the two machine guns and ammunition boxes and run forwards to our positions. With this single round, the enemy has gotten lucky and taken out half of the formation and effectively put our two heavy machine guns out of operation. A man who had been hit by shrapnel with a sucking chest wound dies. The others seem reasonably stable. Fortunately, the use of our two MGs seems to have become unnecessary as the enemy's forward positions are taken out. Over the next few hours, and with the help of our two Sturmgeschütze, we are then able to move on, engage, and silence the bunkers and defensive trenches positioned off to the right. Please check out our Patreon page and see our different levels of support to get access to exclusive footage.
that can't be shown here. Open a free account on our website, military1945.com. Please take the time to subscribe, and thanks for watching.